Hello, my name is Jeff Brignall and I'm the principal of Jackson Liberty High School and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, one of our veteran English teachers, Mrs. Christy Opaleski. The reason I'm so excited to give this introduction is because I know how passionate and dedicated Mrs. Opaleski is to the profession of education and in particular topics of SEL and equity. Since social emotional learning and equity became such hot button issues over the past few years, Ms. Opaleski has been a driving force with the understanding of and implementation into our school and district. Social emotional learning and equity have been district initiative of ours for the past few years and from the beginning, Ms. Opaleski jumped at the opportunity to become a leader and has done a truly remarkable things with our teachers and staff in these endeavors. Not only has she been a teacher leader here at Liberty and in the Jackson School District, she has been a leader and has presented at SEL conferences for the state, the National uh, College Board, Urban Assembly, National Conference, as well as recording podcasts, and a guest blogger for Education First. As you will soon hear, and I hope you understand why I'm so happy to give this introduction, Mrs. Opaleski truly cares for our students and we are so lucky to have her as a member of our Liberty family. Without giving away her story, um, I hope you will, you will too understand what I'm talking about. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Mrs. Christy Opaleski. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming, and especially with all the technical uh, issues or the fact that this is a virtual conference, it's kind of new to everybody. So we have, uh, you know, the camera going and the and all of this technology. So it's exciting. Where you know these are what we expect our kids to be able to do, and now we're practicing what we preach. So without kind of giving anything away, again, I am Christy Opaleski. Thank you, Mr. Brignola, for that introduction. And and I'm giving my TED Ed talk on SEL and equity um, as this story actually happened, and I wanted to share that uh, idea and how profound it, it, it changed my view on education. As an English teacher, I love words. They communicate so much by using so little. Specifically, there are so many synonyms that are nuanced with their denotation and connotation. And for you non-English teachers, denotation is the dictionary definition of the word, and connotation is the feeling associated with the same word. And there are a myriad of nuances when it comes to uh, synonyms and connotation. For example, do female, lady, and woman have the same meaning? Is being skinny the same thing as being emaciated? Is terrorist a synonym for a revolutionary? The denotation is very similar on these words, but the connotations are extreme. Diction, the study of words, their connotation and denotation and level of formality, is something that I have taught repeatedly to my students, but never before did I realize I needed to learn it myself. Fifteen years ago, on the first day of class with my high school juniors, I crafted what I thought was a motivational speech about how in our class, everyone would be treated equally. In our class, everyone has a fresh start to be who they want to be. In our class, I would treat everyone the same. I thought equality was a synonym for equity. I started each class with welcoming rituals using emoji magnets on the board as emotional check-ins. Then, rather than dictating class rules, we created community norms. We collaborated and we decided how and when we would leave a room, how and when we would use cell phones, and how much and how often there would be homework. This worked so well, I decided to add Secret Spy to our routine. The premise of this was quite simple. On Mondays, I would privately ask a student to covertly observe or spy on the class and all the positive actions that he or she observed in the class throughout the week, and then share out on Friday. The point was for students to see the good in each other, to witness those small acts of kindness that we often overlook, and to celebrate these very, very ordinary moments. It started with students just noticing basic manners, and then it sprouted to specific behaviors like everyone put their Chromebook away without being asked, or Ariana shared her book with Maggie when she forgot hers. I was encouraged by this. I felt good about this. And my students, they wanted to be chosen. However, I noticed it was only my high-achieving students and my extroverted students who volunteered. 
And as I wanted real, true community engagement, I consciously started selecting quieter students, ones who were struggling, who were often failing, or who were often absent. I remember when I asked Eduardo, he was so startled and was like, what, no, why? Why, why would you ask me that? I'm not always here, just, just pick someone else. But I insisted, no, Ed, I need you here. I've seen the sketches in your notebook, and I know that you notice things that a lot of kids would overlook. Eduardo agreed to try. He showed up every single day that week. And then on Friday, he surprised me even more with his share. First, it was Ashley didn't curse out Michael for never passing the papers back in a timely fashion. That was a big deal, by the way. And Nick included Calvin in his group when he realized that Calvin was working alone. And the most surprising thing Eduardo said is I noticed that people are people in here, not trying to be something for someone. Pride exploded like a firecracker inside me. I felt validated. I felt hopeful. I felt like it made a difference. At the end of that period, a student asked if I had selected a student for next week. Juliet answered for me. Of course she did, but it's not going to be you or me. Our skin isn't brown enough. A tsunami of emotions hit me, knocking the breath and belief out of me. I opened my mouth to speak, but the bell dismissed me, making me accidental, irrelevant, and all the more ashamed. Eduardo pushed past me, and I could feel the heat of his hurt, his anger, and his sense of betrayal. What just happened? I was itchy, left to scratch myself raw, hoping to claw the confusion and shame out. I wondered, did my students ever feel this way? Did I ever make them feel this way? Needless to say, that weekend I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat, I couldn't grade any essays. All I could do was play that class over and over again in my mind. How could my students think that I was racist? Or was I being a reverse racist? Because kids are kids are kids, no matter their race, ethnicity, sexuality, or religion, right? That's not racist, is it? I fluctuated from self-righteous indignation to haunting shame. I struggled all weekend with my sense of self as a person and with my sense of self as a teacher. Then I decided to do what all psychological and educational research tells you not to do with kids, call them out on their ish. So at the start of class on Monday, I began with my truth. I lied to you in the beginning of the year. It wasn't intentional, and it wasn't even conscious, but I lied to you when I told you that I treat you all equally. I did it, and I don't, but it has nothing to do with the color of the, your skin and everything to do with the light in your eyes. I treat you like individuals. I see you as a person in your own right. The best way I can explain this is through Band-Aids. Everyone will receive a Band-Aid. That is equal. But what if you had a bloody nose, and you had a deep gash, and you had a paper cut? I treated you all equally. I gave you a Band-Aid for your wound. But is that really helpful? Does it lead each of you to handle your wound successfully? No. One would need tissues or a handkerchief. One would need stitches. And yeah, one would probably just need the Band-Aid. Treating you with the same tool is useless. Giving you what you need is what I try to do. Ava, remember our community agreements about cell phones in the front of the classroom? But I let you keep yours in your purse because you told me your mom's in the hospital. Michael, remember our agreements about hoodies? Uh, but I let you keep yours up sometimes because I can tell you're having a bad day and you just need a moment and a space of your own. Sean, remember our agreement about homework, but you told me that you worked the night shift on Tuesday nights and you wouldn't be able to hand it in on time. So I had no problem with this because I understood what you needed. Juliet, you were right about what you said on Friday. I do not treat you all equally, but I do treat you all equitably. And what that means is that I meet you where you're at. I'll give you a tissue, a Band-Aid, or whatever it is you need to be successful. Eduardo looked me straight in the eyes and nodded.
Juliet gave me a small smile. The room expanded with a space for honesty and trust. Trust I had in them and trust that they had in me. After that, I researched how to make my class a safe space for difficult conversations. And I had the revelation, I was being colorblind. According to psychologist Dr. Sherry Castro Atwater, I was erasing aspects of my students and ignoring struggles that they may be going through because of their identity. This avoidance limits students' ability to have thoughtful and tactful conversations about difficult topics, thus making those topics taboo as they progress on in life. So being colorblind is not an option, because being colorblind is not equitable. I decided to keep Secret Spy, but have the students vote on who the spy should be, and you could only be the spy once. I began to ask more of my students. I asked them to share their backgrounds, their traditions, their beliefs, and we added my story to our community norms. My story is a designated discussion time that students have to connect to the literature on a very personal level, either emotionally or culturally. We followed our nonviolent communication discussion protocols, and I gave them sentence stems to assist them in being respectful. Students would share their connection, and then their classmates could ask thoughtful, clarifying questions. That is when I really understood the word community. Community is a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. Students became more interested in the literature and how others would relate to it. They became curious about themselves and each other in the world around them. They became a community. Through these experiences, I realized the importance of words, specifically my words as a teacher. I realized I needed to be more of a facilitator or coach than rather an absolute authority. I realized that equity, when done right, empowers rather than enables, and it connects rather than coddles. Equity is not a synonym for equality, and playing secret spy with a class of 16-year-olds taught me that. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions, or if anyone has any comments in the chat, feel free, and I can have my wonderful principal share them out, and I can answer them. But thank you for your time and for coming to the Equity Conference today. Absolutely fantastic. Thank um, you. Jill Rogers, DOA. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I can see some of you in the, in the Zoom. <laughs> I appreciate you coming. Tanya Breland, kudos. Thank you. Oh, clapping from Jill. Yay. Clapping from Tanya. Thank you. <laughs> Kim Matt, thank you. Uh, 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 we're going too fast now. Um, oh, where's the oh, chat? Hold on. He's trying to keep up all, with all the uh, chat. Love it. Kudos. Thank you. Thank you. Great chair. No questions yet. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll take the kudos. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Good talk. Thanks for sharing. Don Stead. Give it a couple more minutes, yep. and then if not, we can sign off, and you guys can take your break. I know lunch is coming up, and then we've got the second set of sessions, which have some awesome presentations that I hope you'll check out. Tanya, you said time to ask questions. I guess no one is following her lead. Maybe they didn't realize you could ask yeah. questions. <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing. Great talk from Mary Kubaska. Thank you, Mary. Lost Power Jackson, was there a video she played? <laughs> Sorry if you lost power. I know the rain is. Well, there wasn't another video, it was just you. Right? No, just me, me presenting live. <laughs> Great job from Terry Lamphere. Thank you. Anna Tukino, thank you. Thank you. Well, we didn't lose power at Jackson. No, we still have power. Oh, uh, Liz Walsh, thank you so much. Uh, now that you understand how you were perpetuating colorblindness, how would you change some of your earlier interactions? Well, I think I'd be, as opposed to um, 
the idea that I did treat kids exactly the same because I thought like teens are teens and they're like a whole breed of their own. But the idea of incorporating their identity more and looking at their beliefs and traditions and kind of celebrating that diversity as opposed to just kind of limiting it and like kind of almost stereotyping kids like as they're all the same because they are very unique. And I think that's something that we really need to address in uh, the time period that we live in because of technology, social media, because of the changing laws, uh, you know, because of people's belief systems have evolved, we can't treat them the same. So I definitely would not have, you know, kind of excluded, whereas before sometimes I, I was afraid to have difficult conversations in the class. Um, I would, I don't do that anymore. Uh, we have kind of protocols, so if, if something uncomfortable comes up, the kids know how to handle it. If they need a moment, we have a community agreement, like they give me like a hand signal if they need to take a walk out of the room. And again, it's mutual respect. If a kid is going to take advantage of that, then they lose that privilege. But for the most part, it's the idea that you know we want them to have these very difficult conversations on equity, on race, on sexuality, and where do we want them to have that? In an academic classroom where it can be discussed civilly, but we don't allot a lot of time for that in the classroom. It's about the curriculum all the time. So trying to make time with protocols or make time for the kids to share their uniqueness um, and really hear their story. And I've learned so much about other cultures. I've tried so many types of new foods because my students have related to that, you know, during our the, the time my story. So I just wish I had started some of that earlier, as opposed to just being like, oh, kids don't care about that, or you know, kind of perpetuating that color blindness and really seeing them as the amazing individuals that they are and that they can be. Okay, so I, don't, I was trying to read this and I wasn't listening. That's okay. One question was, can you walk people through your equity journey? Oh, my equity journey, wow. Okay, so once um, I realized that my kids thought I was picking on students based on color, I really did start doing a lot of research on equity, on social emotional learning, and it's actually what brought me to the Rutgers and St. Elizabeth program, um, where I have my certificate in SEL leadership, because I really wanted to kind of change the landscape of the classroom. And then once I realized how well it was kind of working, I wanted to do it at a more systematic level, uh, and luckily, where I work in Jackson, they're very open to teachers you know, coming uh, in and speaking with them about different ideas, presentations. We started a teacher leader program with, in conjunction and partnership with uh, New Jersey Department of Ed about five or six years ago. And Jackson has really made it an organic process um, where it's given me the opportunity to share these ideas with the faculty at faculty meetings monthly. And then I have meetings once a month. Um, like I call them pilot meetings with different groups of people. It's just PD uh, and the idea of sharing how to be more equitable, how to kind of look at the whole child as opposed to just the academic child. And I find being a high school teacher, that can be really difficult for us because we are worried about uh, the covering, you know, certain units, making sure that they get, for me, you know, their writing is college appropriate. We're trying to get them ready for that next step, but we don't realize that it's not just about the academics, it's about the whole kid. And with the evolution of technology and smartphones, they're growing up pretty quick. They don't need us to just give them content. They can Google that. It's the idea of sharing experiences with them and seeing that in the literature or in a story or in a culture. Things are handled a little bit differently. And letting them experience that now, be uncomfortable now when you're younger, so then when you go off to college or you're in the workforce, that you can handle it then. And I think that's our job as educators, is to kind of allow those conversations to happen happen in our classroom, invite them, but also let kids know that there's there's protocols or there's uh, in, things in place so it stays comfortable. So you're going to be a little uncomfortable, but the idea is to grow. Um, and so that definitely is where my equity journey started, and it's not finished. <laughs> I'm still, you know, working on, um, you know, different projects in Jackson Liberty. Um, I started blogging to talk about equity. Um, equity in AP has been uh, an issue. That was where I was uh, presenting at the um, College Board Conference. So the idea that uh, really seeing people and valuing them for their individuality and for their diversity, as opposed to just, you know, I teach English and then students. It's I teach students, I teach teens, and then I teach literature. Okay, always putting the, the person first. Would you please repeat how you phrased secret spies to your students? Do you tell them on Monday of the week? 
Okay, so Secret Spy. Um, I did give them the preface the week before, but what they know is that um, I basically talked to them like, we do a lot of good things. I said, but people don't notice it. I was like, so, you know, someone is going to be selected as a spy. I said, and you're just going to pay attention all week, very covertly, because people, you don't want people guessing that you're the spy. So they kind of like that little element of mystery. I said, and you're looking for all the good things that people do. And at first they were like, what? We can't say when they do something wrong. I'm like, no, everybody notices when somebody does something wrong. It's when we do those good little things. Like when Nick really did see that Calvin was kind of hanging out by himself and like he wasn't going to invite himself in a group, Nick just invited him. Okay, um, the Ashley example is true. I had a student who just loved curse words. Okay, and she constantly cursed the kid in the front to never pass the papers back. So when he, she actually got a little shout out that she didn't curse, she was like beaming. And I know that sounds funny, but it works. Um, and so they just like, kind of notice the different things that are going on in the room and then they share. And why the whole room is invested is because they don't know if someone caught them in the act of doing something really good. And also it's surprising, some kids don't realize what good behavior is. Like they don't realize that the way they use their manners or the way that they say, oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Like they don't recognize like that's important. And so they start looking for those things. And again, our brains are naturally trained to look for the negative. It's that fight or flight, um, you know, concept that we're looking for danger, that cyber toothed tiger that's, you know, going to kind of come out and eat us. But to retraining to look for the positive, for the kindness, uh, was a little bit harder. But the students liked it. It was kind of like a challenge. And then they were always excited on Fridays to hear, like, what was going to come out. Um, so I, I talked to students, like, privately on the side on, on Monday. Like, one, I'd, I'd pick one out. And then they'd be kind of watching the class the whole week. And then they'd share it on Friday. And then I would repeat, you know, the, that uh, activity. Other than your terrific talk, is there a book or are there article re, uh, articles, resources you would recommend that would be useful to share with staff to help further attune them to non-colorblind approaches to equity? Uh, definitely looking at uh, Dr. Sherry Castro Atwater's research would definitely, you know, kind of get you with the idea of what colorblindness means and why it's negative. Because to be perfectly honest, when I first started teaching. I thought that was perfectly fine. I didn't realize that I was starting at a deficit. I was kind of like, I'm just going to treat them all the same. Isn't that what they want? No special treatment for anybody. But it's not the idea of special treatment. It's about using their strengths and their individual uh, backgrounds as a way of connecting. And once I saw that, that was really, you know, that kind of changed my viewpoint in education. Anything on CASEL, CASEL has been doing, CASEL is the collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning. Um, if you type that in, it'll come come up, they have an abundance of free resources, and they've been doing a wonderful webinar series, all free, um, as SEL as an equity lever. So the idea of how we can treat the whole child and be equitable, how we can achieve academic success and have a well-rounded child. So anything CASEL related is definitely the way to go. Anything from the RAN Institute or the uh, Aspen Institute is also a really good source, but honestly, those are mostly linked through CASEL. So for the gold standard standard in equity and social emotional learning is CASEL. So I would recommend going to their website and downloading their implement, uh, implementation guides. They have it for the classroom. If you're just looking as a teacher, they have it for school leaders, for principals, superintendents. They put out an amazing toolkit for restarting school in the fall, whether you're remote, blended, or you're all in person. Uh, the fact that these kids have been in isolation for so long, how are we going to re-enter? How are we going to kind of break that barrier and build community again when they've been so uh, separated from each other. Will the presentation be available online after the con after this conference? Yes. We, I'm going to send the video link to the Department of Education, and I'm sure they will post it along with the rest of the presentations. Thank you for asking that. Can you say again what CASEL stands for? CASEL. CASEL is the Collaborative of Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. So it's spelled C-A-S-E-L. That's CASEL. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we're good. Yep, we're good. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your afternoon.